We have a live interview here on Media Buzz with Ron DeSantis, the second place presidential contender, which I'll get to in just seconds. Also, Donald Trump says he probably made a mistake in naming Chris Ray to run the FBI in an interview that just aired here on Fox. The Florida governor joins us now from Tallahassee. Governor DeSantis, welcome. Good morning. Good morning. When you are asked about polls, you say the media do not want you to be the nominee and have created a narrative that the race is somehow already over here today. Washington Post, top of the page. Uh, DeSantis, doubts rise amid uh, early pains for DeSantis. New York Times says DeSantis cuts some staff as he struggles to gain traction against Donald Trump. Now, nobody even votes until January, but is all this doom and gloom hurting your campaign? Oh, not at all, but I think clearly you see um, an effort to, to create these narratives. I think the good thing about it is Republican primary voters are very smart. Uh, they know where these corporate outlets stand on the political spectrum. And so the extent that they become convinced uh, that the media does not want me to be the nominee above all else, that will in the long run absolutely help me. And I think it's, it's, it's interesting that they're talking about some of this campaign process. You know, we were five and a half weeks as a candidate in the second quarter for fundraising. Mm -hmm. We raised more money than Joe Biden did in the second quarter, who's the sitting president. And we raised more money than Donald Trump did into his campaign, who, of course, was the former president. Yeah. And yet they try to spin that negatively. So I think they have a predetermined narrative. But here's the thing, Howie. We were just in Iowa on Friday at the Family Leaders Summit. That was effectively the kickoff uh, to Iowa caucus season. Yes. So Iowans are starting to pay more attention to it. We were able to talk to thousands of people over a two-day period. And the number here. one thing I hear from yeah. people, the number one thing I hear from people is this. When they come up to me, they're like, yeah, you know, I, I knew you did good in Florida. You know, I, I heard good things, but I hadn't seen you yet. And now that I see seen you, I'm for you. And they so like that's going to be what we're going to do over the next six months. But why specifically would the media oppose your nomination uh, compared with their mortal enemy for seven years, Donald Trump? Because I think they know that I would beat Biden and beat him soundly. And then maybe even more importantly, they've seen what I've done with Florida, where we've beat the left on all these different issues. I mean, we've beat them on illegal immigration. We beat them on indoctrination in schools. We've done all these great things. And now Florida, even CNBC is acknowledging we're the top economy of all 50 states. And so I think that they see me as somebody who will actually enact uh, some of these bold things as president. Of course, they don't want that. The, the corporate press wants the status quo. They want the bureaucracy to be in control. They don't want someone like me to come in uh, and dismantle the administrative state. No way. They don't want me coming in uh, and offering strong policies at the border or me coming in and reversing things like Bidenomics and the Green New Deal. Yeah. So both from an electoral perspective and a substantive perspective, uh, they view me as, as this most significant threat to their agenda. You are well known for taking on the the national media, 60 Minutes, for example, after a pretty shoddy story. But your critics say you don't stray much from conservative media. I appreciate you being here on a straight news show. Uh, why not go to more mainstream networks, Sunday shows, and take these them on? people out there. And, and we take questions, and we are going to be doing uh, more. I don't know necessarily about some of the, some of the shows, mm -hmm. uh, but we want to be engaged. At the end of the day, I think that uh, some of our best moments as, as a governor and as a candidate are, are when we're in hostile environments. So we're going to do that. We're going to do more of it. But it is a misnomer to say we haven't had these people covering us. They are free to ask questions. Uh, I call on CNN specifically when we're at town halls and whatnot, mm -hmm. and we'll continue to do that. Right. Obviously, interviews, though, we've very different. It's pretty clear that you're running to Donald Trump's right. You've uh, signed a six-week abortion ban in Florida. Tough approach uh, on parental rights when it comes to trans issues or school books. But if Congress passes a national abortion ban after six weeks, would you sign it? I'm a pro-life governor. I've signed pro-life legislation. Um, I'll be a pro-life president. Uh, I think we will have a really good approach in terms of, you know, where do you go from here in the aftermath of Dobbs? And look, the Congress uh, is probably not the place you want to put your hopes and dreams um, if you're supporting pro-life. And so I think we're going to really have a strong bottom-up approach. Uh, we're going to be working with states and localities to be able to advance the, the cause of life. Of course, there'll be executive actions that we will take, yep. like what the military is doing. Mm -hmm. We'll make sure to appoint good Supreme Court justices and prevent uh, the left from passing national legislation that would override um, a lot of the state's uh, decisions. All right. Now, you were within striking distance 
acceptance of Donald Trump, at least in the polls, it wasn't that long ago. What happened to that momentum when Trump was first indicted? Yeah, look, I think at the end of the day, um, the, the Bragg indictment just elevated uh, him. And it wasn't so much that uh, people were doing it because he was indicted. I think a lot of people, including me, believe that it was a miscarriage of justice. Alvin Bragg ran for office saying he was going to indict Trump. That is not the way the rule of law works. You don't mm -hmm. say, find me the man and I'll find you the crime. So I think there was a lot of sympathy. But then I think just dominating the media coverage, I had gotten a lot of coverage in the aftermath of the midterm election. We always knew with these national polls that that was a sugar high wasn't anything we were too concerned about either way uh, but the, what we found is the more I'm out there uh, the more the more support we get in these early states and it is a state-by-state -state primary and so I think it would be political malpractice to be running for president fixated on a national rather than Iowa New Hampshire South Carolina so that's what we've done you can make up ground and we are making up ground in all those states that is not really going to be reflected in the national poll because they're such small states that um, you're not going to end up doing that. So we're, yeah. we have our eye on the prize. <laughs> Even people who cite the national polls have acknowledged that in those early states, uh, it's, a, it's a tighter race. And there's absolutely lanes. And we just had the Family Leader Summit, Bob Vanderplatz. He's been saying very clearly, Iowa is wide open. Well, I agree with you that it's a state-by-state -state process. National polls don't necessarily need much. There's a long way to go. Uh, I'd also would say that when Donald Trump was indicted the second time on the classified documents case, which uh, uh, is more serious in my view, uh, the same thing happened. The news was Trump 24 hours a day, and that made it harder for all the candidates. But how important are the debates for your candidacy, even though uh, Trump has made it pretty clear he's likely to skip the first one next month on Fox News. I'm gonna be at the debates. I think it's a great opportunity. And especially for a guy like me, there's a lot of Republican voters out there. They like what we've done in Florida. They know I'm a good governor. Uh, and so, but they haven't seen a lot about me up close and personal. So that gives us a great opportunity to be able to share our vision. Uh, how are you going to beat Biden? How are you going to be able to get this stuff done? Uh, what are the key things that, that you want to be able to do from getting rid of Bidenomics to stopping the invasion at the border to slaying the administrative state? All those things are really, really important. And I think that first debate, you're going to have how many? I mean, millions and millions of people are going to turn into it. So I, I look forward to it. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's great to be in an environment where you're, you're asked tough questions and having to articulate why you should be uh, the next president of the United States. And what we found on the campaign trail, these early states, when we're able to make that case to voters directly, right. uh, we get a tremendous response. And so Governor, we're excited for the debates in August. Governor, a common media criticism, and I don't want to hurt your feelings here, is that you are lacking in charisma. You've heard this a hundred or a thousand times. You don't have the common touch with voters. Obviously, you won a record-breaking landslide victory in Florida, so some people like you. Uh, but are you finding the media <laughs> overemphasize personality over policy. Well, well, but they have a predetermined narrative. I mean, for example, they used to say, oh, the governor doesn't do retail campaigning. He's not going to be able to go to Iowa. And then, you know, <laughs> yesterday I'm out there doing events. You know, we have 30, 40 people at some of these things, shaking hands, answering questions, doing all that. They're like, oh, well, he can do it. So these are predetermined narratives that they have. And I think if you look at my reelection, obviously historic landslide, a state of Florida that had been a one point state. But the things that voters would say is typically in an election, you vote for the lesser of two evils. In this case, I'm proud to cast an affirmative vote for a leader that I believe in. Mm -hmm. And I think we developed a, a, a loyalty and a support that no governor has been able to do. And that's because we've stood up for people when it counts. But I think when they do some of the subjective things, uh, the reason why they're doing it is because objectively, I've got a great record to run on. Political success, huge policy success. These are things that not only Republican voters have bought into, uh, but also a lot of independents and even more and more Democrats me, as uh, their party goes more left. So they're going to focus on, I think, superficialities and trivialities. But we have outperformed the national environment in every election I've been on the ballot for in my career. Let me get to a couple of issues. You've said that Republicans are not going to mess with Social Security, but as a congressman, you voice support for privatizing Social Security and raising the return age to 70 for future seniors down the road. What made you change your mind? Well, I've always said, promise made, promise kept. 
I'm a governor of Florida. Of course we're going to protect people's Social Security. Uh, my grandmother passed away when she was 91. That was her sole source of income. Yeah. And that's true for millions of seniors. And so that, that goes without saying. So when people say that we're going to somehow cut seniors, so that is totally not true. Uh, talking about making changes for people in their 30s or 40s so that the program's viable, you know, that, that's a much different thing. And that's something that, that I think that there's going to need to be discussions on. But, um, but that's just the reality in terms of, in terms of where I've been. So I don't think it's necessarily a change. And in terms of privatization, what I always said was, you aren't going to be able to offer individual accounts because there's no social security surplus. There used to be massive surpluses. Yeah, and the was... thought was, if you let people divide, now that's gone. Now so that red. is totally not on the table. Yeah. We got to make sure that we preserve it for our seniors because they depend on it. You say as president that you would clean out the Department of Justice. But aside from the political appointees that any new president can replace, how do you do that in an agency that's mostly career lawyers and prosecutors without being accused yourself of politicizing the DOJ? Well, first, we have to recognize, and the media will typically refer to these people as non-political career people. Now, it's true, they're not political appointees, and we can agree on that. But some of these people have proven to be fiercely partisan and how they actually apply power. And that's a huge, huge problem because you can win the electoral college as a Republican, you get in there, and then what? The executive branch continues to go left because these are, quote, supposedly nonpartisan people, but they're acting partisan. So we're gonna reduce through attrition. Uh, we are gonna remove, we're gonna order every cabinet secretary to reduce the footprint of employees within DC by 50%. So some of that may mean more people retire, some may, you don't fill the positions, but people are gonna be transferred to other parts of the country. And I do think presidents have more ability uh, to fire bureaucrats uh, than they've tried. So for example, we're gonna create something called Schedule F. Anybody that has any policy making role is gonna be recategorized, mm -hmm. not subject to civil service, and can be fired at will. All so right. we have a lot of levers at our disposal, and we are gonna push those levers because we cannot have a situation where we, the people, have the bureaucracy unelected constantly imposing its will on us. We're gonna repose, impose our will on it. Let me get one more in here. Chris Christie, who was on this uh, program a couple of weeks ago, says he's the only one that goes directly at Trump. Uh, insult for insult, calling him a coward and so forth. And that the rest of you just dance around for fear of offending him or his supporters. Does he have a point? I don't do insults, so that that is true. I, I think just getting in this insult game turns voters off. It's not something I want to do. Substantively, uh, we've been very frank uh, at our differences uh, with respect uh, to the former president. I mean, for example, he promised to drain the swamp. It got worse. He did not drain the swamp. He promised to build, have Mexico pay for a border wall. They did like 50 miles of wall. There's massive expansive still there. He said he was gonna eliminate the national debt. They added almost $8 trillion to the debt uh, in four years. And of course, in 2020, he turned the country over to Dr. Fauci and those lockdowns and the borrowing and printing really sent us on a bad course. All I've right. been very, very frank at that, but I have no interest in attacking Donald Trump or any of these other candidates personally. I think we've got to rise above that and yeah, let's you, focus on the you issues. You were once allies. I've got about half a minute, Governor. Did you let Trump define you by waiting too long to respond to his attacks when you were being governor and you weren't officially in the race? Not at all. I think even some of these polls, if you're going to take them for what they're worth, mm -hmm. uh, they say I have the highest favorability amongst Republican voters. And so I think they made a big mistake by spending all that money against me. Uh, I don't think it had its intended effect. And, you know, we have a pack. I can't control it. But I imagine they're going to start lighting up the airwaves pretty soon uh, with a lot of good stuff about me. And that's going to give us a great lift. So we look forward to that. Well, thanks very much, Governor Ron DeSantis. Uh, Florida, really appreciate your time. Thanks for joining us. Please join the conversation. Put your comments and suggestions below in the comment section. Thank you for subscribing to this news channel. You will be notified of any breaking news and new post as you become part and parcel of the McCad TV family. Please like and share McCad TV. We love you all. Please support McCad TV Foundation by joining membership and visiting Amazon UK to purchase the displayed books to aid our orphanage projects across Africa.